Earth may not be forever, but we still have the responsibility to leave what traces of life we can. Building the future and keeping the past alive are one and the same thing. Right this moment, boot up any mid-range computer or laptop and you'll have instant access to almost every PC game ever released. In all of Ludic history, there's never been a time like this. And our backlogs are bigger than they've ever been. I am a monument to all your sins. Compared to how things were just 10 years ago, you no longer need to be a hot hand with DOS command prompts to enjoy some true blasts from the past. The open nature of the PC as a platform has made this kind of archival work and preservation a possibility. But this is only half of the story. There is an entire domain of gaming history that has yet to be accounted for and properly archived. Console gaming. These games are no less important to the history of the medium than their PC counterparts. In fact, many of the most important technological and design breakthroughs happened here, on home consoles. In many cases, years and years before PC gaming finally caught up to the curve. And yet vast numbers of console games that came out before the PS3, Xbox 360 generation are in danger of being lost to the mists of time, and vanishing entirely. This is a crisis of history and preservation and a crisis of art. It's also a sign of just how young gaming is as an artistic medium, in that it's now experiencing the same preservation problems that plagued the early years of film. Fritz Lang's Metropolis is one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made, and full stop, one of the most important films ever put to celluloid. But for nearly a century, there were no high-quality masters of the film available anywhere only grainy and washed-out reproductions, which were also missing about 30 minutes of footage. It wasn't until a pristine reel was discovered in an attic in Argentina in 2008 that the world could finally see Metropolis in its fully restored glory. Hmm, I guess the South American Nazi hunters must have missed that one. Buenas noches, mein Führer. Yeah, yeah. But unlike the early years of film, Classic console gaming has its own problems that are totally unique to the medium. The reliance on proprietary tech like cartridges and system-specific gamepads means that these older games aren't just difficult to preserve. They're nearly impossible to play on their original hardware, unless you're a dedicated collector with thousands and thousands of dollars burning a hole in your pocket. The Quintet Trilogy on Super Nintendo, Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, and Terra Enigma, is a perfect example of what we're talking about here. These games were major milestones in the evolution of the story-driven action RPG, the absolute definition of a genre-defining series. But unless you're willing to shell out hundreds of dollars on the resale market, there's no way at the moment to play these games legitimately. And out of all the games that are languishing in this purgatory for intellectual property, there's one forgotten masterpiece that speaks to why preservation is the defining issue of our time for video games. Join me on this journey, and by the end of this video, you'll understand not only why this game was truly a once-in-a-lifetime event, but also exactly who the heroes and villains are, and why our whole profit-driven system of copyright and IP is so busted, counterproductive, and hostile to art. It's a masterpiece of a cinematic 3D RPG that absolutely goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Final Fantasies and Diablos of the era. And it's a game that is dearly beloved by almost everyone who has had the good fortune of playing it. This game was highly regarded and well-reviewed when it was released, and yet sold only a few thousand copies outside of Japan. This is Panzer Dragoon Saga. Panzer Dragoon Saga is a continuation of the first two games in the series for the Sega Saturn. Panzer Dragoon in 1995, and its prequel, Panzer Dragoon Zwei, in 1996. These two games quickly became the definitive killer apps for the Saturn, owing to their artful blend of epic narrative, 
cutting-edge polygonal 3D graphics, and fast-paced, on-rails shooting. If Star Fox set the template for rail shooters in the era of 90s console games, then it was Panzer Dragoon that took this format and got weird with it. All three of the Saturn's Panzer Dragoon games were developed by Team Andromeda, an internal Sega design team headed up by series creator Yukio Futatsuki. And Futatsuki himself was a young and hungry novice when he started working on the series, only 23 years old, with barely two years of experience at Sega at the time. The young lads and lasses of Team Andromeda were, as Futatsuki put it during an interview at GDC 2019, punk rock game designers. In creating Panzer Dragoon and its sequels, they were also tackling the era's game design conventions head-on, with the aim of creating something remarkable and totally new. Ticking off all of the first Panzer Dragoon's numerous technological and design accomplishments could easily be a video essay all its own. There's full 360-degree 3D camera control, allowing the player to aim and shoot in any direction. The scenery is breathtaking, including that cool-ass water effect that, at the time, only the Saturn could do, creating an endless Asia ocean that is so instantly evocative of those 90s anime vibes. The secret blue water. And a lavishly animated dragon as the player character's mount, whose wings flap and glide through technicolor skies, with its tail rolling and undulating in a remarkably lifelike display. These games were a testament to the dual CPU horsepower the Saturn was packing underneath its unassuming exterior. This was a notoriously difficult console to code for, but with enough effort, dedicated devs like Team Andromeda could work magic. While the sequel's Vi would make some interesting additions to the formula, like branching levels and a progression system in the form of evolutions for your dragon, it was essentially a bigger and better sequel to the first Panzer Dragoon. But the next game in the saga of Panzer Dragoon would be wildly different from those that came before it. Both Panzer Dragoon and Zvi were a looking glass view of a post-post-apocalyptic world. As the player glides through these far future landscapes on the back of their mighty winged beast, unleashing Vulcan blasts and homing lasers, they only ever get tantalizing glimpses from above at the world fallen into ruin below. Thus was the stage set for Azul, Panzer Dragoon RPG, or as we know it outside of Japan, Panzer Dragoon Saga. It was time to get up close and personal with the world laid down in the first two games. Panzer Dragoon Saga tells of an age where the Earth as we know it is no more. Runaway climate change has caused massive sea level rises and flooded all that remains of an ancient and highly advanced civilization. And yet, in other parts of the planet, most greenery and verdant life has given way to wastelands, and creeping desertification. Panzer Dragoon invokes the same paradoxical future humanity is staring down right this moment. A world with too much water, and yet also not nearly enough to go around. The web of influences here is as broad as it is deep. Panzer Dragoon contains the DNA of so many major works of science fiction. Dune and Star Wars may come first to mind, but there are also noticeable parallels to works like 1973's animated psychedelic epic, Fantastic Planet, and Hayao Miyazaki's 1985 anime opus, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. In all of these fictional settings, humanity are the bastard fallen children of their progenitors, doomed to hard scrabble suffering on devastated worlds as they scavenge among the ruins of a bygone golden age. There's one more point of comparison here, and it's perhaps the most important one of all. The team behind Panzer Dragoon cites as one of their main inspirations the French comic artist and writer Jean Giraud, better known by his nom de plume, Moebius. And indeed, tributes to Giraud's iconic bande dessinée style can be seen across the whole of the Panzer Dragoon series. But there's more here than just influence and inspiration in play. Team Andromeda actually hired Moebius to provide art and character designs for the Panzer Dragoon series. And the team was so impressed with his work that they turned his key visual into the cover art for the Japanese release of the first Panzer Dragoon. Dreaming in neon devotees, take note. Truly nothing can escape the long shadow of Jodorowsky's Dune. Movies have heart. Boom, boom, boom. Have mind. Have power have ambition. I wanted to do something like that. Why not? 
and this witch's brew of influences would eventually give rise to one of the most singular and iconic JRPGs ever released. A never-before-seen fusion of RPG and action shooter, with a sweeping orchestral score, epic pre-rendered cutscenes, compelling and fully voice-acted characters, a dynamic hybrid turn-based combat system, and full 3D exploration both on dragon and on foot. It seemed like an airtight plan, the culmination of Sega's attempts to assert itself as a major player in the home console market, one capable of offering high-budget blockbuster experiences that rivaled anything from Square or Nintendo. But these things never work out quite the way they're supposed to. But I found something a lot more scary than cocaine. It's called Nintendo. <laughs> some kitty cocaine! Ah, the 90s. Those halcyon days of the console wars, where the Sega vs. Nintendo arguments spilled across conference tables, lunchrooms, and playgrounds. And for a brief moment in time, it could truly be said that Sega did what Nintendo didn't. You can't do this on Nintendo Genesis! In this brief post-Genesis interregnum of the early 90s, Sega actually had a fairly competitive share of the overall gaming space. From the release of the Genesis down through to the launch of the Saturn, Sega managed to claw back a sizable slice of the market from Nintendo. And with next-generation showings like Panzer Dragoon in the offing, it seemed like the future of video games might just belong to Sega. But a short three years after the rushed-to-market launch of the Saturn, war had changed. From 1995 through 1998, Sega's boom times turned to bust. The company's US office shrank from more than 2,000 employees to under 200, as the Saturn slowly lost ground to a bold entrant on the scene, the newly minted Sony PlayStation, which further twisted the knife by undercutting the Sega Saturn's 399 launch price. 299. <laughs> And so, by the time of Panzer Dragoon Saga's release in 1998, Sega had largely abandoned the Saturn and shifted its focus to the impending launch of the Dreamcast. Sega's declining fortunes did not deter Team Andromeda. If anything, they were so possessed by the ambition of their vision for Panzer Dragoon Saga that they didn't realize just how challenging a task they had taken for themselves until they were right in the thick of it. As Futatsuki told The Ringer in 2018, a fully 3D RPG with beautiful visuals. That kind of game hardly existed anywhere in the world, which meant that no matter what aspect of the game we were working on, we had the challenge of making it entirely from whole cloth. But rather than treat this as an obstacle, Team Andromeda took this as an opportunity to entirely reinvent everything we thought we knew about the RPG genre. There's no fat to trim from this experience, no slow start where your amnesiac protagonist hunts slimes and completes fetch quests in the grassy hills around the starting town. Panzer Dragoon Saga gets right to the good stuff. Awe-inspiring dragons in flight, scenery-chewing villains doing dastardly deeds, and colorful lasers going pew pew pew. Initially, the game was planned to be even more ambitious than the version we got. Rather than a straightforward A to B story-driven experience, Panzer Dragoon Saga was going to take place in a non-linear and open-ended world. The player would be able to visit different regions and complete quests in any order they wished. An open-world game, years before open-world was a fixture in the game design lexicon. I mean, tell me with a straight face that Star Fox meets Daggerfall doesn't sound like it would just absolutely rip and tear. But with the Saturn's hardware proving to be better suited for 2D sprites and artwork than for 3D rendering, Team Andromeda had to ditch their open-world ambitions in favor of a more linear, focused approach. While the resulting game may appear quite hefty, releasing as it did on four jam-packed compact discs, most of those megabytes are reserved for the cinematics and high-quality voice acting. <laughs> Oh yeah, 
This game did the fully voice acted 3D RPG thing a full two years before Final Fantasy X. Panzer Dragoon Saga did nearly everything that Final Fantasy X gets praised for, at a time when Final Fantasy X was just a twinkle in Yoshinori Katase's eye. But Panzer Dragoon Saga is actually quite svelte, as far as epic JRPGs go anyway. A playthrough will only take you about 12 to 15 hours, or maybe 20 if you're angling for a 100% completionist run. This is no Chrono Cross or Xenogears, where revisiting a beloved classic means you're looking at a minimum 40 to 50 hour commitment to see all of the main story beats. That's not to say that Panzer Dragoon Saga is a simple or easy game. It's the opposite, really. Just as the game demonstrates a keen sense of how to efficiently convey narrative and characterization, it shows a similar focus when it comes to modernizing JRPG standards for the 3D era. All of the usual JRPG mechanics are here. Your dragon will gain experience and level up as you defeat enemies, just as you'll learn new abilities that can augment your defensive skills, heal and protect you, or deliver a crushing final blow. You can also swap out parts for your dragon rider's gun, either to boost your overall firepower or to better exploit an enemy's weak points. Up until this point, most Japanese RPGs followed the canon first laid down by those early dragon quests and final fantasies. In these games, all the action takes place on a single plane, and is driven entirely through menu interactions, with your party trading blows and spells with the enemy until one side emerges victorious. But Saga did something that, at the time, was totally unique, and had never been seen before. As Fatatsuki put it, the team's main ambition was to answer a singular question. What does exhilarating shooting combat look like in an RPG? Panzer Dragoon Saga is indeed the answer to that question. The game's combat system plays more like a hybrid, turn-based action shooter than an RPG. The player's dragon can swoop around your targets in all four cardinal directions in order to dodge enemy fire or zero in on weak points, as indicated by a dynamic compass on the HUD. Depending on how you position yourself, your attacks can do increased or decreased damage, and your character's defense likewise depends on the angle from which enemies attack you. You'll want to pay close attention to your positioning because how quickly you defeat enemies and how much damage you take affects your rank for each fight, which in turn determines how much experience and loot you receive. Outside of battle, the player can mutate their dragon by shifting around an ability slider to focus on four separate characteristics, changing the dragon's in-game appearance in the process. You can boost attack for laser power, agility to charge actions quicker, defense for, well, defense and spiritual for your magical berserk skills. But there are trade-offs to these boons. Boosting attack will make your character less powerful in spiritual, and vice versa, while boosting defense will subtract from your character's agility. This is no gimmick mechanic either. Careful and thoughtful use of the dragon mutation system is a requirement for winning through some of the game's toughest fights. As each encounter proceeds, the player's action gauge will fill up, with each charge allowing you to fire Vulcans on a single enemy, perform a multi-target laser attack, use items, or unleash your dragon's special berserk abilities, the game's equivalent of a magic system. The combat encounters in Panzer Dragoon Saga are the furthest thing from your standard JRPG battle of attrition. Cinematic camera angles combine with a bombastic and sweeping orchestral score, adding verve to nearly every single fight and bringing a sense of excitement and dynamism, even when you're facing standard issue foes. Actually, we need to take a moment or three to gush about that soundtrack a little bit more. This is a series that is already known for its wild and inventive OSTs, so much so that the soundtrack for the first two Panzer Dragoon games were recorded in Redbook Audio. To this day, if you have copies of the games handy, you can pop them into the nearest CD player and start jamming out. But Panzer Dragoon Saga raises the bar that much further thanks to some truly masterful compositions by game music ace Saori Kobayashi. Glittering sci-fi synthesizers and ethereal vocals, cavort with thunderous percussion and mournful stringed instrumentals that wouldn't be out of place in a classical orchestral suite. There's mystery and an electric sense of momentum here, the outset of a journey into a strange land, twinned with the promise of untold mysteries waiting to be uncovered by an enterprising explorer. It is, far and away, 
fact the single strongest constitutive element of the entirety of Panzer Dragoon Saga. The soundtrack is eminently listenable to, on its own merits, making for the perfect kind of rainy day JRPG music to smoke and study to vibe. And it was such an important and influential work of game music that, in 2018, Brave Wave Records put out a special 20th anniversary remaster of the Panzer Dragoon Saga OST, composed and overseen by Kobayashi herself. But perhaps most interestingly of all, the Panzer Dragoon Saga soundtrack was not recorded in a vacuum and then grafted onto the game, as is so often the case. After the designs of the different levels and encounters were already finished, Team Andromeda sent mock-ups over to Kobayashi so that the game's music could be composed in a way that lent the maximum amount of pathos to the visuals. Panzer Dragoon Saga is nothing short of a brilliant, cross-genre fusion that embodies the term avant-garde, as in far, far ahead of its time. RPG power progression and leveling mechanics wedded to action shooter combat and adventure game exploration, this is the mainstream standard today. But things were very different in 1998. With the exception of maybe Front Mission Gun Hazard, there was simply no other game that had done what Panzer Dragoon Saga did when it arrived on the scene. And its influence can be felt in everything from Fumito Ueda's Ico and Shadow of the Colossus, all the way through to the mad lad himself, Yoko Taro. Though Taro has given some predictably evasive and trollish answers in public when asked about the series' influence on his work, it's safe to say Panzer Dragoon was perhaps the chief inspiration behind the development of the action shooter RPG Drakengard, aka Dragon Dragoon, which is the series that gave us Nier and then Automata. Again, we could easily spend a whole video just recounting the outsized influence this game has had on the medium. Panzer Dragoon Saga is audacious, breathtaking, and trailblazing, and still remains one of the all-time great RPGs on console. So it's a genuine travesty that Sega smothered this game in its crib and made it almost impossible to play today. Panzer Dragoon Saga is in so many ways a tale of tragedy both the tragedy of its narrative and the tragedy of the circumstances surrounding its release. The game's story begins with our protagonist Edge seeing his co-workers and father figure gunned down by military madmen, only to be saved by a mysterious armored winged beast. He then embarks on a journey to understand the nature and purpose of his new dragon friend, and that of the mysterious woman Azil, who seems to share some connection with the ancient race of progenitors whose ruins dot this blasted world. Throughout his quest for revenge, Edge is beset by dead ends, false starts, calamity, and death. The nature of Edge's mission is open-ended and ambiguous, left up to the player's interpretation. Is he a chosen child of destiny, possessed by a righteous cause to do battle with the forces of darkness and restore light to the world? Or was Edge merely in the wrong place at the wrong time, trapping him in some kind of allegorical purgatory? a half-living corpse shambling through the ruins of a half-dead world. Both of these interpretations of Panzer Dragoon Saga's story are, by design, equally correct. The experience is what you, the player, make of it. And the game drives this point home by utterly shattering the fourth wall during the finale, with the revelation that the player is the divine spirit alluded to so many times throughout the game, whose presence possesses Edge and gives shape and form to the world around him. そして数千年にわたる使命が終焉する時が来たのさあ all of life, or in this case, all of Panzer Dragoon Saga, is nothing but a waking dream. Shadows and light dancing at the half-remembered edges of your consciousness. And you, 
the player, are the dreaming dreamer. With a flick of your finger, you can summon up strange and beautiful worlds, or consign them to languish forgotten in the darkness eternally. The Concil Rea Nostra. Dana Zas Echi. It's a sad and understated resolution to this saga, one that mirrors the melancholic circumstances that surrounded its creation and its release. Teams on both sides of the Pacific Ocean had to crunch mightily for this game, putting in ungodly work hours at a time when no one batted an eye at this kind of overwork, especially in Japanese business culture. Two members of Team Andromeda passed away during the development of Saga. One killed in a freak motorcycle accident, and the other, a senior mentor figure to Fatatsugi, took their own life. And when it finally came time for the game to see the light of day, the disappointments continued to mount. By early 1998, Sega had already made the internal business decision that the Saturn was a failure, and were shifting their focus and resources to their next generation console, the Dreamcast. In Japan, a muted marketing campaign and declining interest in the Saturn generally meant that Panzer Dragoon Saga sold just over 100,000 copies, a far cry from Sega's initial expectations that this game would be their multi-million selling trump card in the console wars, surpassing even Final Fantasy. And outside of Japan, where the Saturn had been essentially left for dead, the situation was even more dire. Panzer Dragoon Saga ended up being one of the final games released for the ailing and failing Sega Saturn. With Sega ditching the Saturn in favor of the Dreamcast, only a mere 20,000 copies of Panzer Dragoon Saga were pressed for release in the US, and a scant 1,000 more for Europe. And this, more than any other single factor, is the reason why Panzer Dragoon Saga is a game nobody played. As befits such a weak release, the game was barely promoted or advertised at all outside of Japan. And the marketing we did get could do little more than make self-conscious jokes about how hard the game was to find, like the infamous Edge Mask ad from the September 98 issue of EGM. Putting it more plainly, with this paltry kind of support from Sega, there was no way this could have ended other than in failure. In a different world, in a different timeline, one where Panzer Dragoon Saga released on the PlayStation rather than the Saturn, there's no doubt that this game would be spoken of in the same reverent and hushed tones reserved for Xenogears, Grandia, and Suicoden 2. That's just a matter of simple arithmetic. The PlayStation is one of the best-selling consoles in existence, weighing in at more than 100 million systems worldwide, and fully 80 million of those sold outside of Japan. By contrast, the Saturn sold less than 10 million consoles worldwide, and only 5 million of those outside of Japan. But then, Panzer Dragoon Saga on a different console wouldn't be Panzer Dragoon Saga. As Fatatsugi himself once put it, on PlayStation, the colors are brighter, and on Saturn, the colors are cloudier. To express the atmosphere of Panzer, it was necessary to have the color palette of the Saturn. It can be comforting, to pine for a better and more just existence, for the alternative timeline where our talents and brilliance are duly recognized and we can bask in the glory we deserve. But this is not reality. Our hardships, struggles, and our failures make us who we are just as much as our triumphs. And all too often, we cannot see and appreciate our impact until many, many years after the fact. That's true for me. It's true for you watching this video right now. And it's especially true of Panzer Dragoon Saga. All of which is why, today, Panzer Dragoon Saga is perhaps the rarest and most expensive game ever released in the US and Europe. It is prohibitively expensive to play this game legally, and even the word prohibitively doesn't do justice to the situation at all. Assuming you're able to even find a US or European copy of the game, you'll be looking at spending a minimum of over $1,000 just for the discs alone. A pre-owned set that includes the case will cost at least $1,500 or north of $3,000 for sealed copies, if those even truly exist anymore. Which gets back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this video. 
more so than just about any other game languishing in copyright purgatory right now, it is effectively impossible for the average retronaut to play Panzer Dragoon Saga on the original hardware. Besides the cost of the game itself, the Saturn also had a notoriously low-quality CD drive, prone to wear and tear, making it that much more difficult to play the game nearly a quarter century after its release. But even the dismal commercial failure of Panzer Dragoon Saga didn't spell the end of the series. While Team Andromeda did disband after releasing Saga, many members went on to work for developer Smilebit on Panzer Dragoon Orta, the sequel that was released on the Xbox in 2002. And series creator Fatatsugi would go on to develop Phantom Dust, a spiritual successor to Panzer Dragoon that was released for the Xbox in 2004, and again for the Xbox One and Windows in 2017. You actually can play this one right now, for free, on Xbox and Windows PCs. Orta was a brilliant return to form of the classic rail-shooting gameplay of the first two Panzer Dragoons. And Phantom Dust was an absolutely ahead-of-its-time fusion of the shooter RPG, deck-building, and adventure game genres. Recent years have seen even more encouraging news for Panzer Dragoon aficionados. A decently competent remake of the first game was released in 2020 by Megapixel Studios for the Switch and PC, with a remake of Zvi supposedly to follow sometime in 22. But sadly, Panzer Dragoon's saga will not be such an easy nut to crack. For many years, the deep lore slash rumors surrounding this game suggested that its source code had been lost at some point, either when Team Andromeda disbanded or in the lead-up to Sega's ill-fated exit from the console hardware business after the Dreamcast. Without the source code, a remaster or re-release of the original Panzer Dragoon saga would be basically impossible. But recently... During a GDC 2019 panel on the Panzer Dragoon series, Fatatsugi gave this intriguing answer when asked about the status of Saga's source code. Uh, so we mastered up Saga, and then between <coughs> our master date and our release date, I left the company. So the real truth, the true story is that I don't know what happened to the source code. Okay. However, However, I have heard rumors, and maybe everyone here has heard rumors, that it may have been discovered uh, somewhere at some point. But forget that I even said that once you leave this room. <laughs> that said, the outlook for Saga still isn't all that rosy. At best, having the source code will make it a bit easier to create an upscaled, emulated version of the original game if they decide to go that route. But a full-on, Bluepoint-style HD remake of the game will take hundreds of staffers and millions and millions of dollars to execute, regardless of whether or not they have the source code and assets for a game written in 25-year-old assembly language for a dead and buried console. And given how niche Panzer Dragoon Saga was even at the time of its release, and the relative lack of interest in preserving all but the most famous and notable games of this era, at this point, I wouldn't expect much from Sega or any other developer or publisher. The most exciting news on this front actually comes from the fandom. A dedicated group of Panzer Dragoon fanatics recently launched the Azel Resurrection Project, an attempt to create a proof of concept for a Saga remake, in the hopes that Sega will license the game out for third-party development, as was the case with the release of Streets of Rage 4. But no matter whether we pin our hopes on Sega or on the fandom, it seems like we're a long, long way off from Panzer Dragoon Saga seeing the light of day again. And so, that's where this story ends. Through a combination of bad luck, bad timing, and the oppressive strictures of international copyright law, one of the all-time greatest RPGs will languish forever in the Sega vaults, alone and forgotten in some dark and dusty corner. Well, fuck that noise, because it's not over yet. The reports of Panzer Dragoon Saga's death have been greatly exaggerated. This game is not dead and buried, and it never has been. 
Emulation software for the Sega Saturn has existed in some form or another since the early 2000s. But for quite a few years, it did seem like it might be nearly impossible to create a lightweight and widely compatible emulator comparable to what was available for the SNES and PlayStation. And this was due, in large part, to the Saturn's dual CPU hardware, which made emulation an even trickier proposition than coding for the system in the first place. I mean, one of the most high-profile Saturn emulators is named Yabausei, which is literally an acronym for yet another broken and unstable Saturn emulator. But 2004 saw the first release of the SSF emulator, which set the standard for compatibility and speed on Windows PCs. And in the years since then, emulators like Mednafen, Kronos, and Yaba Sanshiro have raised the bar even further, with implementations that can work standalone on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Android and iOS, as well as plug-in cores for RetroArch. The notion that Sega Saturn emulation sucks is just that, an urban legend. There was a grain of truth to it in the early days, but since then, it's nothing but a myth that has spun wildly out of control. From at least the early to mid-2010s onward, anybody with a mid-range GPU or laptop could play the majority of the Saturn library on their PC, including Panzer Dragoon Saga. Thanks to emulation, it's a certainty that more people in the West have played this game now on their PCs than were ever able to play one of the 21,000 original English language copies floating around out there. I never owned Panzer Dragoon Saga myself, or a Saturn, but I do have extremely fond memories of tag-teaming it with my best friend in middle school through a marathon sleepover playthrough. It was only in 2016, through emulation, that I finally got the chance to experience this game in full, on my own terms. And emulation is how I recorded all of the footage you're watching in this video. Now, there are still no shortage of grognards and purists out there who will loudly insist that the only way to play these older games is on the original hardware, and preferably on a vintage CRT while you're at it. And that's great! This is why I've kept my old SNES around after all these years. Collecting old games is a lot of fun, if you can afford it. But for the vast, vast majority of players, this simply isn't a realistic option if you want to actually play retro games and engage with this art as more than just a collector. Which brings us to the second urban legend that we need to dispel. Emulation is illegal! Emulation is not illegal, and has never been ruled as such by any court or political body. The opposite, in fact. A high-profile court case where Sony tried to take on the emulator creator Bleem ended with Sony hanging their head in shame, and the Bleem devs totally vindicated. It's not even illegal to download game ROMs, due to the principle that these are effectively backup copies of the original software, which are perfectly legal for personal use. It's only a crime to distribute, as in host these backup copies, which is where the gray legality of emulation comes more into focus. But there have been relatively few major lawsuits over emulation, and for good reason. Game companies desperately do not want to see this issue tried in court, because they're afraid of the legal precedents that might be set if they lose. Again. It's far more advantageous for them to let emulation continue to exist in legal limbo for the time being, while doing everything in their power to cultivate the aura that emulation is something dangerous and illegal. This is, as writer Cory Doctorow so expertly put it, bullying as a business model. And not coincidentally, this is exactly Nintendo's strategy when it comes to their retro back catalog. By merely creating the impression that something is potentially profitable, and that, therefore, derivative or open source creations would infringe on that potential profitability, a huge corporation can effectively bully their way into a unilateral claim of ownership over a piece of art. And this is the glaring loophole that plagues modern IP law, the deciding factor that tilts the playing field totally in the favor of sociopathic corporations and business executives. Thus, our busted and asinine system of copyright and IP, 
the root cause that has consigned Panzer Dragoon Saga and countless other games to an undeserved obscurity. And it's the same reason why I'm dealing with DMCA-powered corporate censorship on my YouTube channel on the regular. Because in reality, where old games are concerned, companies like Sony and Nintendo function as little more than glorified copyright trolls, sitting on a dragon's hoard of pilfered intellectual and artistic works that they did not create. They're just gaming's equivalent of rent-seeking landlords, the very definition of parasitic and unproductive labor. What else can we call it when Nintendo releases a bare-bones upscaled emulation of Skyward Sword and has the absolute brass clackers to charge more for it than the game cost when it first came out? Even the most disinterested observer can see this for what it is. Nintendo is responsible for cultivating this sense of artificial scarcity, and now they're trying to cash in on it. It is abundantly clear from how major gaming companies have treated their back catalogs as total afterthoughts that the big console manufacturers really don't even want us thinking about their old games. Playing old games via emulation means you're off that treadmill of planned obsolescence and constant consumption that is so, so profitable. And then who knows? You might even start getting some funny ideas about copyright and the public domain, and open source software, and how information truly wants to be free. When you buy old games and systems on the resale market, none of that money will reach the pockets of the people who created the game, or even the publisher or console manufacturer. It all goes to the reseller. Of course, there's also the matter of having to spend huge amounts of money to even acquire these old games and consoles in the first place. Emulation is the great equalizer. Emulation solves another problem in gaming that is every bit as critical to these questions of access. Because emulation, is also the key to games' preservation. Long after the last diskette rots, when the last SRAM cartridge battery dies out, when the last optical disc laser sputters and goes dark for a final time, emulated backups will be there, ready and waiting for us. And this is the sad truth of the moment. The people who are regularly blasted as pirates and copyright cheats are, in fact, the real archivists, doing the hard work of preservation that no one else will. When retro gaming becomes outlawed, only retronauts will be free. Academia has utterly failed on this issue, treating gaming history as a curiosity, unworthy of the serious considerations afforded to film, music, and even television these days. And the game publishers themselves have failed even more miserably, and deserve even more shame. They are refusing to safeguard their own history because it might run counter to their shareholders' goal of maximizing quarterly returns. Big game companies are quite infamous for speaking out of both sides of their mouth on this issue, too. Sony still won't let you play the first Metal Gear freaking Solid on the PS4 or PS5. But they were caught red-handed selling a glorified reskin of the open-source PCSX emulator in their PlayStation Classic mini console a few years back. Now, it's not all grim darkness on the retro games front. It's very encouraging to see that, say, Square Enix cares enough to preserve retro titles like Romancing Saga and Legend of Mana so that they're playable on modern hardware. But examples like this are far and away the exception and not the rule. So whether you're a committed retro devotee or just someone interested in peeling back the mist-shrouded layers of gaming history, there's never been a better time to jump in. If you're at all interested in retro emulation, you can and should start right now. Don't wait for an officially sanctioned version of your favorite old game, because it probably isn't coming. And don't hold your breath waiting for these mega corporations to do the right thing, because you'll run out of air before it happens. There's an entire universe of classic games out there right now waiting to be rediscovered. So what are you waiting for? More so than almost any other genre of game, classic Japanese RPGs exert a special kind of nostalgic pull on those who have played them. An outsized feeling of Natsukashi, if you will. Yusa. 
these games instantly take us back to our youth, to those halcyon days when the world seemed full of promise, with new adventures waiting just round the bend. These are colorful, engaging storybook tales brought to life in front of our eyes. And their low mechanical barrier to entry means they can be enjoyed by just about anyone, whether you're a diehard or a total novice. But going even deeper beneath their surface level meanings, JRPGs can offer us something that's both comforting and highly necessary in uncertain and unstable times. These games remind us that we are never really stuck in one place. We are always changing and adapting. Progress and growth are never far out of our reach if we put our minds to it. We are not fated to be victims of circumstance forever. We can become masters of our lives with perseverance and a little help from our friends. JRPGs can tell us a lot about this past, but could they also contain the key to the future? The world of Panzer Dragoon Saga is permeated with a different kind of ineffable emotion, of longing for a golden age we never knew, and of sadness for the world of ruin that awaits us now. And these feelings are very familiar these days to pretty much anyone, especially if you're under the age of 40. The only certainty about the age we live in now is how uncertain things truly are. As the UN's recent IPCC report lays bare, catastrophic climate change is no longer a future hypothetical. It's here. It's happening right now. And it's going to be harder and harder to stop it with every month that goes by. The 21st century will be defined by the same malaise that has marked its first two decades. Widespread suffering, economic privation, and intense social dislocation. The world of Panzer Dragoon, of massive sea level rises and creeping desertification, no longer looks quite so speculative. It's starting to look a lot like the world we're going to inherit. Panzer Dragoon portends a world in ruin, but it might also contain within itself the key to surviving the calamity that awaits us. Because if we truly are upon the cusp of a new dark age, then it's going to be up to us to preserve what traces of art and culture that we can. If retro games are going to survive into the future, it's going to be through the dedication of emulation devs, ROM hackers, and individual enthusiasts and collectors. More than any other art form in existence right now, video games are at risk of having their history forgotten, lost, or destroyed. This is how we keep hope for the future alive, just as the Ordo Sancti Benedicti illuminated manuscripts in order to preserve human knowledge and culture during the Black Plague and the First Dark Age. The world we know is ending, and our lives aren't going to work out the way we'd hoped. But as the saying goes, extinction is also an opportunity. We can find guidance and hope in what came before us, if we know where to look. This is why emulation, piracy, call it whatever you like, this work is more critical than it's ever been. This is the essential labor of art preservation, the archival work that the actual IP holders so often refuse to do themselves. Building the future and keeping the past alive are one in the same thing. In a 2005 piece that, somewhat fittingly, is only available on archive.org, Panzer Dragoon creator Yukio Futatsuki described the raison d'etre that motivated him to create the series, and to press on with his creative endeavors through some very difficult and heartbreaking moments. I want to create something with permanence, something that will remain in the hearts of the group of people I made this game for, something for those who are starving for a new experience, something that will stay fresh and unique 10 years after its release. Something that uses graphics and sound to leave a mark in the minds of players. Something that doesn't look like any other game. In this, Panzer Dragoon Saga has already succeeded beyond Futatsugi's wildest dreams. Now, the torch has been passed down, and the future is up to us. Thank you for watching. Well, Dragon Riders, it's been a while, hasn't it? 
No sugarcoating it, the past year and change was a miserable state of affairs for me. I lost family members to COVID and cancer. I had my own health scare that put the fear of God in me. I've watched my best laid business plans and friendships totally fall apart. And in the meantime, the world has just kept on crumbling. Depression sucks and the new Great Depression sucks even harder. But what can you do? Sitting around waiting for my life to finally start happening isn't an option. I still have so much more to say. Things are messed up for just about everyone everywhere right now. So to everyone who has taken the time to watch, share, discuss, and support my work, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, whatever. If you enjoyed this video and it made an impact on you, then please share it with a friend, an enemy, your local Discord server, you name it. YouTube is a brutal game, and every little bit of support helps. And if you find my work meaningful, then please consider chipping in a few bucks via Patreon. This funding is the lifeblood and lifeline that is keeping me afloat during this crisis. Anything you can give is hugely appreciated, like the fine people you're seeing on screen right now. Your support has a direct, material impact on my content. Thanks to the generosity of my Patreon supporters, in early May, I was finally able to finish a big upgrade to my Elden Rig. This new machine is an absolute beast that rips through video editing and encoding tasks, and it made it that much easier for me to finally drag this video across the finish line. Part of the reason for my extended hiatus is because, almost as soon as my last video came out, my YouTube channel was subjected to a blizzard of copyright BS two separate DMCA takedowns, another automated removal, and more than a dozen flagrantly illegitimate copyright claims on my work. It's exhausting and incredibly demotivating. This website will absolutely destroy you if you let it. Which is why this essay marks something of a turning of the page for me. From now on, I'm going to be focusing on video games, purely because this content is so much less likely to get swept up in the YouTube copyright dragnet. It's disappointing because I have a lot of writing on other topics that I wanted to bring to life on my channel. But the effort isn't worth the risk at this point. YouTube just isn't a good place for some of the work I want to do. But here's the ultimate upshot. More gaming content and more long-form videos like this. To that end, I've got a part two for this video that's already in the works. If this video was an overview of the state of play of games preservation, then the follow-up is going to be the official Dreaming in Neon field guide to games that can only be played right now via emulation. Look forward to that, and sooner rather than later. I'm also still doing weekly variety talk streams on Twitch every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. If you're catching this video in time, then please consider checking out the first ever Dreaming in Neon Emulation Symposium, where I'll provide a crash course in everything there is to know about emulation, ROM hacking, and how best to experience the depth and breadth of retro gaming. It's all going down on Friday, July 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank you again. See you next time.